And as I understand it, when you look at, uh, for example, in the book of Genesis, the story of creation, mm -hmm and read it from this Kabbalistic perspective, you get a vision of the creation that's not so different than the one you might find in physics. Uh, basically, that, that's, that's true. Uh, the Kabbalists have a symbol for creation. It's Beit, the second letter of the Hebrew Aleph Beit. Um, and we're, uh, alphabet comes from Aleph Beit, obviously. Um, and it means, uh, it means uh, several, several meanings, which are all related. It means a container. It also means a house. That's where, you know, temples are called Beit or Beth something. The Beth is another pronunciation of Beit. Uh, but it also means, uh, in the Tarot system, it means the magician, uh, that which creates. So it has a creative element in it. But the secret of creation is containment. So in order to create something, you have to contain something from something else. You have to make a distinction. I think uh, G. Spencer Brown wrote about the first distinction. So in a way, uh, Kabbalah is indicating how things are created from nothing. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the principles that you have developed linking your background in physics, your work as a physicist mm -hmm. with the, the work of mystics and, and shamans is that all of, all of you are concerned with vibration. Yes. Yes, right. Um, like the sound of these words of power are vibrations. Yes, in fact, um, the idea of vibration as being a major facet to uh, not only the ancient Kabbalist's view, but also the shamanic view, was something I, I've, I discovered and then discovered again. Um, my teacher, Carlos Suarez, in Paris, when I was living in Paris, had taught me about this, and that was back in 1974, and then it rekindled uh, in 1989 uh, after spending time with the Peruvian shamans. Um, I remember the first time I met uh, Jorge Gonzalez Ramirez, who is a uh, Peruvian shaman, and uh, I asked him simple questions like, well, how do you heal somebody? And uh, then I said, well, before I, I, you, I, you, a, you answer that question, I said, how do you know when someone's sick? And he says, oh, it's, I can tell by their vibration. I said, oh, their vibration. Uh, well, how do you do that? And so then he reaches over, and just like I'm reaching over, he grabs my wrist and he starts holding my wrist like this. And then I said, oh, and you know, I'm thinking, oh, this guy is you know, maybe primitive. And You mean pulse, that's what you mean, you mean pulse. And then he says, that too. And then I realized that when he's speaking about vibrations or bodily vibrations, he's not just speaking about the pulse, but he's speaking about a number of different vibrational energies that are present in the body. Well, after I talked with him and then had an experience with him in which I directly felt his vibration in a, in a shamanic trance state that I mm -hmm. entered with him, uh, I then had talked, uh, be, even before and afterwards, I had talked with a number of other shamans in different parts of the world. Uh, Anglo-Saxon shamans, Druids, uh, I talked with shamans uh, from different Indian tribes, the Chumash <coughs> Indians down in uh, Ventura, California, also the Ogallala Sioux in South Dakota, and they all keyed me into the idea that vibration was extremely important in their worldview. So when I wrote the book, The Eagle's Quest, I decided that in order for me as a physicist to make sense out of all of this, I'm, I'm really going to have to approach it from a, as much of a scientific viewpoint as I can, so I made up a series of postulates or hypotheses. And the first hypothesis, the major one, is that the shamans see the universe in, as made of primal vibrational stuff. And that really tied into my understanding of quantum physics, because in quantum physics we talk about quantum waves, which are vibrations out of which all matter is eventually, uh, e e eventually is created or emerges. Yeah. So uh, there was a direct tie-in right there. Uh -huh. And these quantum waves, as I understand them, are non-physical in the sense that they are probability waves. Exactly right. And it's very similar to the shamanic uh, idea. Uh, quantum physics is a very bizarre business. I mean, it's the business of business, and nothing could be further from our normal sense of reality than that business. Yeah. It deals uh, with, uh, with things which are, in a sense, unobservable, out of which we feel all observable phenomena ar will arise or arises. And one of the basic assumptions about, of quantum physics is the quantum wave nature of all matter. That matter, uh, unobserved, matter on its own, uh, moves and vibrates in, in, in waves. But waves of what? Are they water waves? Are they sound waves? Are they electrical waves? No, they're actually waves of nothing. 
They're, uh, they, they're, they're called probability ways. And probability is something that you do in your brain, in your mind. You think. You need to determine what's probable and what's not probable. So we're dealing with something which is akin to almost mind stuff, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, this is not really too much of a surprise. Physicists already had a shock to their system delivered in 1905 when Einstein uh, pointed out that there was no ether to support waves of light. So when a light wave is waving, what is it waving in? It's also waving in nothing. So light is a kind of a halfway between material and energetic reality that we see in terms of substance and almost uh, the mind of God, if you will. Yeah. One of your other hypotheses is that shamans work with the realm of, of mythos, of, yes. of myths and legends. And I get a sense that this quantum probability waving around in nothingness could very well be the same stuff of myths. Uh, in fact, I would suggest, although I imagine uh, some scientists might find this more difficult to accept, that it is a kind of a myth. Um, we have myths about subatomic reality. Uh, there isn't anybody alive who's ever seen a subatomic particle, uh, that it captured one and held one in their hands or, or put one in a, in a bottle and examined it. Um, and quantum waves are something like this. In fact, I would suggest that what scientists do is to create myths that they can substantiate through the process of mathematics and through the process of observation. Mm -hmm. But what they observe and what they believe is creating what they observe are often quite separate from each other. So in a certain sense, mm -hmm. quantum physics is a, is a myth that uh, Western culture mm -hmm. lives by. It, what I think I hear you saying is that there's a process of reification going on, that the quantum physicists set up their experiments in a certain way to create these results. And then they say, ah, this is the objective world out there. Exactly. And, not always acknowledging their role in creating it. Exactly. It's uh, the, the original uh, spirit of science, which I think uh, begins almost with Sir Francis Bacon, is the notion that there is such a thing as an objective world. And probably if we look back through history, we can see the concept arising in the early Greeks, uh, maybe with Democritus and the notion of that there were atoms of stuff which were fundamental. Um, and the idea of an objective reality was somehow to separate or remove uh, the, the human brain or the mind from this object of reality. So somehow we had the idea that an observer observed what was already out there. But in the quantum realm, when you set up an experiment, you're not just observing what's already out there, you're participating with what's out there. And in a sense, you are actually creating your experience of what's happening out there. So if you look for certain phenomena one way, you see phenomena in that way. If you look for it in another way, you see it in a contradictory guise. The so-called wave-particle duality is an mm -hmm. example of this, or the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty, the position and momentum of an object is another example uh -huh. of this. Well, would you say that the various uh, shamans that you worked with in different cultures, each with their own mythological system, are doing something much the same? I would say there is a, a very strong tie in here. Um, Shamans, for example, deal in a world of spirits. Um, they, uh, they deal in uh, mythological connections between events. Uh, they're in a world that Jung would call a world of synchronicity. Uh, for example, uh, in China, if a shaman is going to heal you, and on that particular day when the shaman is coming to you, he notices a bird flying north to south or east to west, that will affect your healing. In other words, that's a message to him about what type of healing you need to undergo. Mm -hmm. So the shamans are, are constantly dealing with, uh, uh, I, I would say, synch synchronicities and mythical elements. Uh, a bird doesn't just mean a bird, it means something having to do with flight, or it may have something to do with the dead spirit that's flown. Um, and uh, because of their belief structure in this, uh, as much as our scientific belief structure in things like particles, they uh, see the world differently. Uh, Western scientists uh, see the world uh, in a certain way. Uh, we, all, we have jokes about, uh, well, don't mind him, he's just a physicist or something like that because physicists seem to be so quirky about trying to analyze everything and see everything in terms of separate parts. Uh, well, this is a, a penchant, a, a, way, or a way of seeing that physicists, physicists have developed as a result of their training. In a very similar way, uh, shamans 
have developed a way of seeing because of their training. And their training is actually longer in time mm -hmm. than the training of a physicist.